When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, all you wonderful unshaken saints out there. I'm Jared Halverson, thrilled as always to be joining you for another week of Scripture study. We actually are moving forward into a new book of Scripture this week, and it's 2 Corinthians. We've spent three weeks on 1st, and now we'll spend two weeks on 2nd, and it's all going to be time well spent. These are amazing letters to saints that were so similar to us in our own day. I mean, yes, Paul was writing to ancient Corinthian saints, but he's, he might as well have been writing to the modern church. Think about what we studied the last three weeks. Are there still divisions within our, within our congregations? Sadly, yes. Are there still pulls towards immorality or draws towards intellectualism? Sadly, yes. Is the world still too much with us? Yes. But how do we navigate it? Paul has given us amazing advice. I loved his grand finale last week in chapter 15 about the resurrection. And to any of you who may be struggling with the loss of a loved one, please know that my heart goes out to you. But also, please know that the words of Paul go out to you as well. Spend some more time in chapter 15 until you can talk smack to the Grim Reaper, like we said last week, until you know that the sting of death has been swallowed up in victory through Jesus Christ. I love 1 Corinthians, but I love 2 Corinthians also. And so these next two weeks, we have amazing things to study. And what a cool thing that it's a sequel. We don't get many of those. Uh, I mean, in the Old Testament, we got First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, but that's just continuing the history these ones aren't, it's, not, it's hard to find the history here because these are just points in time where Paul is addressing a letter to these people. But the fact there's two different points in time is an amazing advantage. We'll see a sequel to the Thessalonians. We'll see a sequel to Timothy. But to have a sequel here to the Corinthians, again, you get to see what's going on in Corinth in this moment, freeze frame, and then fast forward, and then freeze frame again. And now what's going on? The first, the first letter was, had a lot of calls to repentance. Hmm, how are the people going to react? And then how's Paul going to react to their reaction? And 2 second, second Corinthians is going to inform us on some of that. Actually, Hollywood is the expert in sequels because they love to crank them out, right? You find a cash cow and then you start milking it for all it's worth. And there seem to be two different types of, of sequels. Hollywood style. One is, you could call it the standalone sequel. Those are the type that you didn't have to see the first movie to make sense of the second. Those are kind of nice. Just jump in. It's, don't worry about it. They'll reintroduce the characters. You're, you won't be lost. This one has its own internal logic and a, a plot line that doesn't totally depend on the first one. You good? The other type <laughs> is the one that does depend on the earlier ones. And you better know all that has gone before or you will be lost in this new one. I mean, you take the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, if you're just entering into that world, well, I hope you have a, a free month on your hand to watch every movie leading up to the latest iteration. Okay? Now, which type of sequel is 2 Corinthians? Eh, in a way, it's both. It can stand alone, and it does it beautifully. It's one of my favorite places in Scripture to study adversity and comfort. And, and you can just pull out those principles from 2 Corinthians without having to know anything that happened before. And honestly, if you're going through hard things, perhaps this letter might end up being one of your favorites of all that Paul wrote. On the other hand, it's also a good you know, aftermath of what we studied in 1 Corinthians. And the better we remember and know what Paul was dealing with in that first one, the more parts of the second one will make sense. I mean, even to think about like I said, how did they react? And, and how will Paul react to that reaction? How, are we open to feedback? Will we change and have a soft heart and thick skin so that we can respond in a proper way when someone cries repentance? I mean, as a teacher, I get critiqued all the time. I get student evaluations, and you better have thick skin to read those. I have colleagues coming in and offering me feedback at the end of class. I've come to be very grateful for it, because if we are open to that kind of, 
con constructive criticism. And yes, it can be more constructive and doesn't have to be so critical. Uh, but if people know how to give it, and if we are open to receive it, then amazing growth awaits us. That's probably why I was hired to be a seminary teacher in the first place 25 years ago. Not because I was any good, but because they saw potential for growth. And more important, a willingness on my part to accept the coaching, the counseling, the advice. As they would come in and say, oh, you put into practice the things we told you about last time. Like, well, yeah, I needed to. I kind of crashed and burned last time. Like, yeah, well, that, you said it, not us. But <laughs> I'm glad that you were open for the help. You were coachable. You were teachable. And that makes a world of difference. When I was coaching my son's flag football team when he was like 10 or 11, I remember after one game, hey, we're getting in the car, and I said, son, you want any feedback about the game? And he looked over a little nervously, and he said, nope, and then he turned away. And I was like, oh, okay. In that case, great game. And that's all I said. That's all he would let me say. Oh, yes, you did have a great game, but I was a little sad that, he, maybe he was just concerned, like, oh no, dad's gonna say, and I'm like, no, I, but there is room for improvement. And if we're open to it, then uh, yes, improvement awaits. Will they have improved since last time? How did they respond to 1 Corinthians? Well, 2 Corinthians is going to give us some clues. Now, let me, let me lay out some history before we get into the doctrine, okay? And I just want to briefly walk you through a timeline of sorts to connect 1 Corinthians to 2 Corinthians and when is this happening in the ministry of Paul and so on. Now, I'll have to tell you in advance, take it with a grain of salt because there's still some confusion among scholars here. And that's usual. Uh, there's, scholars tend to disagree with each other because there's often evidence on both sides of any issue. There's an old saying that where there are two rabbis, there will be three opinions <laughs> because even the one rabbi can't agree with himself. Well, academics are kind of that way too. And it's a little confusing with Corinthians because you have multiple visits to Corinth and multiple letters to the Corinthians. And so putting them in the right order can be difficult, especially since we don't have all the details or all the clues. Okay? So I'm going to lay out a, a possible timeline with seven steps on it just to make sense of when is all this happening and in what order. Okay? And like I said, take it with a grain of salt because this has not been <laughs> set in stone. There's still disagreement. But here's one possible approach. Number one, Paul is on his second missionary journey. He had, this, he had already been on the first one to Asia Minor, right, Turkey. Uh, but now he's gone further west on his second mission uh, off into Greece, right? And that's when he went to Athens and saw the altar to the unknown God. He goes west from there and he ends up spending a year and a half in Corinth. This is all taking place during Acts chapter 18. But that's the first step on the timeline. Second, he's still on his second missionary journey but, well, the missionary transfers came, and he's left Corinth, and he's gone to Ephesus back in Asia Minor. He ends up spending three years there. That's, I mean, these are long missions, and that takes place in Acts chapter 20. But it's during this time in Ephesus that he probably wrote a first letter back to the saints in Corinth. Unfortunately, it's likely that this is a lost letter. It no longer exists. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do we know about a letter that doesn't exist? Well... Glad you asked. Remember uh, when we were studying 1 Corinthians, in chapter 5, he tells them, I wrote unto you, past tense, so I've already written you something, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Oh, okay, so 1 Corinthians is not 1 Corinthians? Well, likely no. He must have written them something earlier, and yeah, he chastens them for immorality among them, and speaks of not companying, so there's excommunication. So this was likely a strongly worded, kind of stern letter calling them out for their sins that they're allowing to, to take place among them. Okay? So that's kind of first, we had our first visit, now we've had their first, his first letter. Well, how do this, the Corinthians respond? Well, they write a letter back to Paul. And this is step three on our timeline. This is when Chloe, remember we met her in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the, uh, the house of Chloe writes a letter to Paul describing some additional problems among the saints. It's like, okay, immorality was not our only problem. Uh, there's division. There are people wanting you, and others wanting Apollos, and others wanting Cephas, and there's, there's massive intellectualism as we are sister city to Athens, and man, Paul, can you, can you help us? We need you. Well, Paul reads that, and in step number four of our timeline, he writes a response to Chloe's letter, and that's what we have in 1 Corinthians. 
Okay? So again, it was most likely a second letter, but it's the first one we have. So we'll call it first, but it's responding to Chloe's concerns. It addresses those issues that we, we saw the last three weeks. Now, step five in the timeline, Paul goes back to Corinth for a second time. This is now on his third missionary journey. And as part of this, some scholars call this the painful visit, because as he refers to this visit in 2 Corinthians, we'll see it today, he talks about it was hard. It was, a lot was weighing on his mind and on his, on his heart. He had a heavy burden uh, as he's continuing to cry repentance and trying to solve the issues on the ground there in Corinth. So there's third missionary journey, but second visit to Corinth. After which you get to step six. And this is the trickiest one because we really don't know if this happened or not. Okay. Step six is after that second visit to Corinth, Paul writes another letter. And it's another lost letter uh, that most likely was a scathing rebuke about more problems that he's seen. And how are they going to respond to that? Now, I say this is tricky because was there an additional lost letter? Or is he referring to 1 Corinthians, which is a, a found letter? You see, what we're dealing with is a verse in 2 Corinthians 2 that talks about Paul writing a letter to the saints. We're just not 100% sure, is that 1 Corinthians or is it yet another letter that we no longer have? Okay? And then we end with step 7. Paul is still on his third missionary journey. He meets up with Titus, one of his favorite junior companions. And Titus had been there in Corinth for a while. Remember how he ended last week? And he's like, take good care of Titus. He's a good guy. I vouch for him. He, he's, he's amazing. So listen to him when he comes. Well, he came. And then he left and meets up with Paul and reports on everything that's been going on in Corinth. Isn't that what you would do with an old mission companion who comes back from an old area of yours? And you're like, oh, how's the so-and-so family? What are they, these converts doing? And, and did they ever solve that issue in the elders quorum? And, you know, whatever it might be. So Titus is reporting on that to Paul. And then Paul writes to the Corinthians in response to Titus's report. And that's what we have in 2 Corinthians. Are, are you with me? Is this clear as mud? multiple visits, multiple letters, maybe more letters than what we have. But essentially what's going on is this back and forth between a group of people and a missionary who absolutely loves them and is concerned for their spiritual well-being. And so wants to know, I mean, really, how are things going on the ground? And when he finds out that things are not all as they should be, he pleads with them to change, to repent, to fix things. And how do they respond to that? Well, we're going to see. But can we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and let Paul readdress these saints that he's already written to, he's already visited several times, he's heard the latest update from Titus, and mm, you deserve another letter from me. Verse 1, Paul's salutation begins, as usual, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. So yes, I'm reestablishing my apostolic authority. If there were those that were shouting, I'm for Apollos or I'm for Cephas, then, well, you probably weren't for Paul. But the Lord is backing me up here. I'm an apostle by his will, not by my own. So please believe me when I teach you these truths. I'm not alone in them, by the way. Also, Timothy, our brother, he's staring over my shoulder. He's, he's wishing you well. He's giving his best. And you remember him, one of my favorite junior companions. Well, we are writing unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. But not just them. The church has been growing since our first letter. So I'm also writing to all the saints which are in all Achaia. And that's southwestern Greece, kind of the whole region around about Corinth. And what's the first message that Paul wants to give these saints? Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I said some strong things last time, but it was out of love. I pray that you receive them in the same spirit that they're given. And it was a spirit of grace and peace. I want you to end up at the peace that passes all understanding. And it's going to take the grace of God to get you there. But I'm offering them to you from the very beginning. Offering them to you from God himself. And then Paul describes God with two of the, the most beautiful titles you could ever ask for in Scripture. 
He says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then how's this for two incredible titles? The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. How wouldn't that reassure you to come unto him? No matter what you've done, no matter how bad it's gotten, no matter how many things I had to call you out for in my first letter. Don't, don't you know that your Father in heaven is a Father of mercies? God is a God of comfort, and He's trying to comfort you. That's why He's calling you out of your sins into the realm of comfort that comes through forgiveness. Now, think about these two titles. Father of mercies. The Greek word there could also be translated pity, but an even better translation is compassion. He's the Father of compassion. And what I love about compassion is it has this connotation of a depth of feeling, a visceral kind of gut level down deep in the bowels of mercy, which is a phrase that will actually be used in scripture. It's the heart of things. It's where your feelings lie, down as deep as they get. And that's how God feels about you. This is the God who weeps, as Enoch described him in Moses chapter seven. This is the father of compassion. And think about where compassion comes from. Take the word apart, and then we'll put it back together. Calm, passion. And what's calm? You Spanish speakers, it's con, and that means with. You Portuguese speakers, that's, it's com, and that means with. And so we have this with prefix connected to passion. And what's passion? We think of that in terms of romantic love. But no, the word itself simply means feeling, but a depth of feeling. In fact, passion can also simply mean suffering. That's how deep the feeling is. When we talk about the passion of the Christ, it's the agony he endured in Gethsemane and Calvary. It's what he felt for us as he came down to be with us. In fact, speaking of con words, think condescension alongside calm passion. He came down to be with us so he could suffer alongside us. So he would know exactly what we're going through. That's why the Father sent the Son. The Father is the Father of mercies, the Father of compassion. And Christ is compassion personified. But it's the Father's compassion that sent him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. This is the Father of mercies, the Father of compassion, that wanted his Son to come down and feel everything we feel right alongside us. You understand? And that other phrase, the God of all comfort, the Greek word there, it comes from paraclete. And paraclete is the name that we give to the Holy Ghost as the comforter the Father sends. This is an entire Godhead that is defined by its compassion and mercy and desire to comfort us to the core. God is our Father of mercies. Christ is that mercy come to earth. And the Holy Ghost is our comforter to help us feel close to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It, it all comes together as we're trying to become at one with all of them. You understand? Now notice what he says here about this God of comfort, this Father of mercies. He says, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And tribulation could be broadened to include affliction, anguish, distress, persecution. The whole thing is assumed in that Greek word. And why does God allow us to go through such things? Well, first, so he can comfort us. And second, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I love how Paul is addressing this issue here because usually when we suffer, our questions are, why? Why am I going through this? And then how? How do I get out of it? Or what am I supposed to do in this situation? And Paul is beginning to answer those kinds of questions. You're not being punished by some angry God. No, this is a father of mercies. This is a God of comfort. And as you're going through hard things, why does he let you? So he can introduce himself to you as that type of father. As one who wants to be with you in those sufferings so he can have calm passion with you 
and second step so that you can have calm passion for those around you. You can comfort them in the same way God has comforted you. We're in this thing together. There's an atonement on the horizontal as well as atonement on the vertical. We're trying to love God and love our neighbor, and compassion is the way to do it. Fellow suffering is the way to do it, which requires some suffering on our part. Can you imagine signing up for a class in college called Empathy 101? Hmm. I don't know if I'd want to enroll in that one. But notice the curriculum. What's in it? Is it just a bunch of readings about compassion and defining the Greek term and so on? Or is there going to have to be a lab component and not just a classroom lecture? Am I going to have to get into people's lives and suffer alongside them? Or even stronger, suffer as if I were within them myself, wearing not only their shoes, but their feet. You understand? In, in some ways, empathy and compassion are sister words. Because the passion of compassion and the pathy of empathy is the same Greek root. It's that suffering, it's that feeling, that intense, deep, bone deep, gut deep kind of intensity. And if the calm is with, what's the M of empathy? That's in. Compassion, I'm suffering with you. Empathy, I'm suffering in you. And why did Jesus come? Why was mercy sent by the Father of mercies? So he could take Compassion 101. Actually, no, let's call it Empathy 505. It's an upper division. Uh, he, was, he got his master's in it because he's the master of mercy. He got his PhD in Compassion because, uh, because he understands everything we went through. That was the gift he received in Gethsemane. The gift he gave was forgiveness, but the gift he received was perfect empathy. I understand everything you've been through because I was in you as you went through it all. Talk about at one moment through our hardest trials, but Jesus comes to feel that with us. In fact, I'm, I'm moved by something Joseph Smith taught when he was in Liberty Jail. And Liberty was his moment of greatest affliction and suffering long-term and wondering if he'd ever get out, but it changed him. Joseph was a different man after liberty than he was before it. But among the things that he wrote, some of which has been canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants, but some of which has not been, from an uncanonized portion, listen to something Joseph taught. He writes his fellow saints, Dear brethren, do not think that our hearts faint as though some strange thing had happened unto us. For we have seen and been assured of all these things beforehand and have an assurance of a better hope than that of our persecutors. Therefore, God hath made broad our shoulders for the burden. We glory in our tribulation because we know that God is with us, that he is our friend and that he will save our souls. Think about what carried Joseph through that time of trouble. God is my friend. He is suffering with me. And when we understand that through the atonement of Christ, he has compassion and empathy for all of us, it does give, it does give purpose to our pain. I'm coming to know God through all of this. And if you want to add an additional aspect, it allows me to comfort other people as well. We sometimes talk about consecration as being the good stuff. Our time and our talents and our means and, and our goods, and anything I can offer the Lord. He's like, oh, I, I can make a lot out of your good stuff. But don't confine yourself to that. God can make incredible things out of our not so good stuff. He, if we'll consecrate our sorrows and our sufferings, he can do amazing things with that too. He can take our ashes and turn it into something beautiful. And in some ways, if we were to take our trials and consecrate them through the lens of what we just saw here at the beginning of 2 Corinthians, when I'm afflicted, it gives God a chance to comfort me. And knowing his comfort, I can now, well, knowing my affliction and God's comfort, 
I have a greater source of understanding others around me who are suffering in similar circumstances. I can have compassion for them. I can have empathy because I've been in their shoes in some ways. And I can reassure them that just like the Lord comforted me, He will comfort you. And I'll do my best to comfort you in the meantime. I was amazed at something Viktor Frankl said about his time in the concentration. Concentration. Concentrate. How's that for a Freudian slip? Concentration camps became for him a consecration camp. Because he realized that I, I can't control what I'm going through, but I can control my response to it. I can't control the Nazis' action, but I can control my own reaction. And amidst all this meaningless suffering, I can find meaning. And that is what will make the difference for me and for others. The book that he wrote as a result was called Man's Search for Meaning, after all. And as he put it, if you can find a meaning for things, it helps you get through them. He said that human beings can go through almost any what if they have a why in mind as they endure it. Why, why am I going through this? What does God want me to gain? And if we internalize these phrases from, first, from 2 Corinthians, why am I going through trouble? Why has God allowed me to, ha- to endure all of this? So I can have greater compassion. More genuine empathy. It's what Elder Maxwell realized when he was wondering, why do I have leukemia when I just want to keep serving the Lord? What did he say? The Spirit came and whispered to him, this is so that you can teach with authenticity. That's, I guess, Empathy 505 has steep tuition costs. you got to go through hard things. But as a result, you can teach with authenticity. You can give real reassurance. You have compassion to offer because you've acquired it. And the only way it really comes. That's why Jesus did what he did. Remember Alma's beautiful words? Jesus suffered according to the flesh. So that he might know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people. It wasn't just cognitive. He didn't read the book. It was experiential. He went through it. He was in us. So he could comfort us as only, as only he can. When my wife was struggling with infertility early on in our marriage, she was the Relief Society president in a married student ward filled with people hoping to have children themselves. She could understand their struggles if, those, if the good news was not forthcoming. In, our, in all my wife's work with people that are struggling with trauma that has led them into the world of addiction, she can speak of her own troubles and tribulations, losing her mother when she was eight, losing her brother when she was 15. When you're Job's daughter, you go through hard things. And she can empathize with people. She is an empath unlike anyone I've ever met. But she earned that empathy the hard way. As as I've talked with my own classes about mental health challenges and some of the things we've faced as a family, you can just see in the eyes of some students. Thank heaven. I have a teacher who will understand me in my struggles because he's been through those things himself with his own family. I'm grateful. It's hard to, to, to thank God for our trials. But when we see the meaning in them, the purpose in our pain, something I can consecrate for the good of others, it does help us endure them and endure them well. Now, as Paul goes on in verse 5 through 7, he says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, and they certainly did in him. He'd been through so much. But as they abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. I think about this. This is directly proportional. How much are you suffering? Well, then, to that exact degree, you will receive the consolation that you need. If your sufferings abound, your consolation abounds. And it's in Christ. It's by Christ. If misery loves company, then imagine sharing that misery with the Messiah. Imagine watching with him in Gethsemane, and then him watching with you in all of our 
lesser gardens. In another letter later on, Paul will talk about the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. And it's a fellowship with true unity, true compassion and empathy. There's no better group of people to be a part of, but it's suffering saints who have come to know a suffering Savior through their difficulties. Now, Paul says something else in the next verse that's really interesting. He writes, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings. Okay? So that's one thing that we need to get out of our affliction. It's meant to help you acquire consolation and salvation. That's the goal of this. But then he flips it, and it's really interesting. He says, or whether we be comforted, well, why would that happen? Well, again, it is for your consolation and salvation. Wait, wait, either way, that's what we're aiming for? Well, exactly. He says, our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So again, back to that direct proportionality. If you're going to suffer, then of course you're going to be consoled. Those go hand in hand. It's just a matter of time. And whether God delivers you from your trials or delivers you in your trials, either way, there is consolation. There is comfort. It will come, I assure you. And again, how can I assure you of that? Because it's always come to me, no matter what, what, whatever I'm dealing with. But go back to that middle, that middle language. Whether it's comfort or whether it's affliction, either way, what's its end goal? consolation and salvation. Now this is odd because it's the identical language both times. Consolation and salvation is the ultimate goal. It's where I'm trying to get you. The question is, what's the best starting point? And that's going to be soul specific. As God knows you as his son or daughter, what's the best way to help you come home? Will it be through a life of difficulty or a life of relative ease? Everybody seems to have moments of both. So what, but where's the center of gravity? What's the ratio of good times and bad times? Best of times, worst of times. What, how much of each do you need to get you to trust in me? To help you come and to come to know me. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. It's interesting to me to think about something Elder Boyd K. Packer once said. At first I wasn't sure if I believed him. He said that sometimes the hardest trials are the apparent absence of any. And yet there is more equality in our trials than we realize. And I'm like, wait, huh? How do... He was describing some really hard things. But then he was describing some really good things. And he was saying, yep, they're all trials. And you're like, huh? The, har the hardest one might be the absence of opposition? It's like, well, then sign me up for that one, please. <laughs> Can that be my trial? Everything comes easily. All, all is well. But the more I thought about it, what's the purpose of life? It's to come to know God. It's to receive ultimate salvation. Right? But to come to receive that, you have to come to know God along the way. And from my own experience, nothing tends to introduce us to Him, or introduce us to Him quite like adversity. Think about where the church is growing fastest. It's where people have hard lives, not easy ones. Because if we have easy lives, it lulls us into a false sense of self-sufficiency. I don't need God. I don't need help from heaven. I got everything I need right here on earth. Oh, that's tragic. The ease of your life has become an obstacle to your eternal progression. Oh, that sounds like adversity to me. I guess the question would be is how do I force myself to rely on God when circumstances don't require it of me. You understand? And then Elder Packer's other comment, there's more equality in our trials than we realize. And God will tailor those trials to the individual. Which ones do you need? How, again, the ratio of good times to bad. I, I, I'm just trying to get you where you need to be. Consolation and salvation. And, and it's not a consolation prize. It's the greatest gift that God could ever give his children. Come home to me. 
I'm, I'm trying to get you there, however circuitous the route might be. I even wonder, though, about another piece of language he used. On the one hand, the language is identical. It's consolation and salvation as the destination, no matter where you start. Okay? Affliction points you in that direction. Comfort points you in that direction. It, it All lo roads lead to Rome if you'll let me lead you. Okay? But then there was this other language that there's a difference here. Because he said, whether we be afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation. Or if we be comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. What's the, what about the we versus your? And I do, I think it applies across the board, even if it's we and we, or your and your. The things I'm going through are pointing me in God's direction. But I also wonder if the things I'm going through are helping me point you in God's direction. Because there is this altruism here. There is this Paul as missionary, as apostle. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you to that ultimate goal of consolation and salvation. And what in my background has best prepared me to make a difference in your life? Or what in my current circumstance is qualifying me to bring you home? And I love the thought as a missionary, as an apostle, as a servant of other people, no matter what I've been through, I can help you. If I've been through hard things, then I can offer you my empathy. If I've been through easy things, I can offer you my strength. If you are down in the depths, am I in the depths with you? It will provide you company and, com and compassion. If I'm not in those depths, if I haven't been through that like you have, I can... If I'm not down in, I'm standing. Well, great, I can lift where I stand. And I may not be able to give you the kind of reassurance like God took me through a similar thing and, and I came out on top. It, but it can be, God hasn't made me go through that. But he's given me strength and time and means. I can consecrate good stuff to try to help you as you go through your bad stuff. Understand? Understand? No matter what we've been through, God wants us to become instruments of his peace and instruments in his hands to help shepherd the sheep toward the goal of consolation and salvation. That's what it's all there for. Now, next verses, 8 through 10. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our troubles which came to us in Asia. In other words, I want you to know what we've been through. It's been hard. Remember what he said back in chapter 15? It was in Asia that I basically died almost daily. Or in chapter 16, it was in Asia that I, had, I was surrounded by many enemies, many adversaries. That was a hard part of my mission. And I don't want you to be ignorant of that. That way you'll understand when I promise you comfort, it's come to me as well. I haven't lived some kind of life in a bubble, but protected from affliction and persecution or, or tribulation and trial. I, it's my middle name. But... I came to know the Father of mercies through all of that. You'll come to know him in the same way. So I'm not, I, I'm not keeping you in ignorance there. In fact, the way he describes it, we were pressed out of measure. Imagine that kind of pressure, that kind of difficulty. Off the charts, out of measure. He says, above strength. So this was more than we could handle on our own. In so much that we despaired even of life. We didn't know if we were going to make it. Like I said, we died daily. Well, there were days we thought we'd actually die. But, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Oh, do you get a sense of Paul's conviction? It's conviction laced with compassion. I'm here for you. I'm suffering with you, right alongside you, in you, real empathy. But you've got to know that we're going to come out okay. Christ came, uh, overcame it all. This is what Jesus was trying to say to Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. The Son of Man hath descended below it all. Art thou greater than he? No. Paul, I've been with you. And the way he describes this, the sentence of death, oh, but it's only death. Really? That's all I got was the death sentence? No, it's nothing. 
Like, what, that doesn't scare you? Well, no, because Christ overcame death. He conquered it. The grave has no victory. Death has no sting. Because he raised himself from, to life, and he will raise us as well. So if death is no, no longer the, the issue, then what do I have to worry about? What's the worst you could do to me? Nothing. But then the way he ends the phrase, even better. He, notice the, the verb tenses. He delivered us, past tense. He doth deliver, present tense. And now we trust that he will yet deliver, future tense. We think of Ebenezer Scrooge with his, his three ghosts, the ghost of Christmas past and present and future. Well, this is a different ghost. It's a holy ghost. But he is a ghost of comfort past and comfort present and comfort future. If you've seen him comfort you in days that are past, you'll get through your present no matter what it is. And he'll continue to do that through your future, come what may. Honestly, there's something powerful about coming to know God through those hard things. Otherwise, our, I don't know, we just don't get it enough. We haven't been through enough. We have, we're still in the creation stage where life is easy and good. And we haven't yet passed through a fall stage where we're wondering how we're going to make it on. Well, we make it on to the atonement and through the atonement. We came to know God in our extremity. There's actually a line in The Count of Monte Cristo. A friend of mine uh, reached out last week and said, Oh, I was looking past you on the video, which is always a wise thing to do. <laughs> Easier on the eyes that way. But he said, I noticed on your back wall you have The Count of Monte Cristo. He said, I love that book. And so do I. Uh, but one of the things that Alexandre Dumas wrote in that book that is so moving to me, he said that for the happy man, prayer is but a jumble of words. And often that's all it is. We're just saying the same old things because I don't really need God's help, but I'm supposed to pray. I'm not that thankful for the food because it's always plentiful, but I know we're supposed to say something before we dig in. Okay, fine. For the happy man, prayer is but a jumble of words. Until sorrow comes to explain to him the sublime language by means of which he speaks to God. Oh, so beautiful. Have you learned to speak to God? Have you developed the sublime language? It's a vocabulary of vulnerability. It's a language of loss. These are words that adversity teaches. But boy, does it change our prayers. It deepens them. It scours out the soul. It, it carves out space for compassion to enter. And so, trust that I know what I'm doing in allowing you to suffer and joining you in that suffering. In some ways, when we say, oh, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you, and it usually doesn't, but we say that, in a way, Jesus said exactly that. Letting you go through the, the trials and tribulations of, of mortality, it will hurt me more than it hurts you, because I have to take that hurt upon myself. I take that collective pain until it's infinite and eternal. Talk about pressed out of measure and above strength. That was Jesus, crushed beneath an infinite load. But he rose above all things so he could lift us out of all things and do so with perfect compassion. And it's a compassion he will always offer us. I know we need to move forward, but one last thing, if I can just remind you of a phrase in verse 8 that struck me. Because of some hard things my wife and I have been through and really wondering how much do we share with other people, how much do we share with the kids? The phrase he says at the beginning, we would not have you ignorant of our trouble. And I think there is wisdom in letting people in on what we're suffering. Though at times there is wisdom in choosing not to. And this is going to have to be one of those situations specific, let the Spirit guide you. Because like I said, there are times it's wise to shield others. 
and parents might be going through hard things and I don't want the kids to have to, to feel everything I'm dealing with. I've, I've heard that missionaries are sometimes counseled, don't tell your parents at home every hard thing you deal with. Especially back in the old days when it took so long for a letter to be sent and then read and then sent back. If you were in a foreign mission and, and mail was slow, it's like, don't tell your parents about that hard thing because by the time you, it gets there, you're out of the trial, it's behind you, it's not a problem, but now your parents are freaking out back at home. And they're like, do, do, we, do we rally the troops? Do we go save our, our, our daughter, our son? Bring them back from this, this horrible situation in the mission field? And by the time they write you the letter in return, you read it, you're like, what? What are they talking? Oh, yeah, there was that one thing. That was like one day, and it, I guess it happened to be the day before I wrote my letter home. I got to be careful with that. <laughs> okay? There are times where, yes, we... we can and should keep other people ignorant uh, because it might be a burden they cannot bear. Then again, there are times where we should not keep, keep people ignorant because they could help us bear those burdens if only they knew what they were. Like I said, you'll have to decide together, if you're suffering together, about who, how much do you share and to whom, if any. But there is some value in letting people know what you've been through. They'll recognize in you a safe conversation partner. Or what you're going through currently. Uh, they'll, need, they'll know that now here's someone I can share my compassion with. And I can suffer alongside them or lift alongside them. Depending on if I'm in a moment of affliction or a moment of comfort. Either way, let's head together toward consolation and salvation, shall we? Well, verse 11. Ye also, helping together by prayer for us. And speaking of lifting where we stand, speaking of helping others, what a beautiful description of what praying for others really looks like. It's helping together by prayer. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Oh, that's a really interesting insight into adversity also. You see what he's saying is, okay, I didn't keep you ignorant. I wanted you to know what I was going through, partly so you could help us together by prayer. But notice what happens. If you pray for me, now you know what I'm going through, you start praying for me. And then what happens? You see God's hand in my life. You see him blessing me, whether pulling me out of those trials or just strengthening me through them. But because you were part of the prayer, you can now, well, I'll put it this way. You were part of the prayer of petition. Now you can be part of the prayer of thanks. If I'd kept the, the suffering to myself, I, I, then, I therefore keep the prayer to myself. But then I keep the praise to myself as well. Whereas letting you in on this, not only will you be a help, but you will see God's help and you will rejoice in it right alongside me. Isn't that beautiful how we are multiplying praise in that way, Paul then says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity, and other versions of this say, in holiness, which I like even better, in holiness and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you, or, or toward you, as we would say. Speaking of, as we would say, Conversation is not the word we would use there. The word in Greek suggests your conduct. It's how you live your life. It's not just what you're talking. It's not talking the talk. It's walking the walk. And what Paul is describing here, because of everything we've been through, man, we were humbled. We were brought to our knees. But while we were down there, we stayed on our knees and we prayed. And I know you've been praying with us, for us. We came to know God and God came through for us. Comfort past, present, future, it's all assured us. You can join in those prayers of praise with us because oh, I rejoice and my conscience is clear to rejoice right alongside me that God has been purifying us so that we could act in holiness, so that we could act in sincerity, so that through his grace we could not just talk but walk the path of promise. Do you see what God is making of me? I'm thinking of some people that are probably listening right now 
who have been through devastating difficulties, whose lives have been completely upended because of adversity, and yet to see their holiness and their godly sincerity, to see the grace of God in their lives, and more than their conversation, their conduct is so holy. Yes, they talk the talk, but they walk the walk, even if physically they are unable to walk themselves. Oh, spiritually, <laughs> they are sprinting forward and inspiring me in the process. Now, in verse 13 and 14, Paul tells us this. We write none other things unto you that what ye read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. In other words, our letter, think of 1 Corinthians or other lost letters that he's written, it was straightforward. You read it, you acknowledged it, or in other words, you understood it. We didn't write anything that was over your head. We wanted to be crystal clear in everything. And we, we're going to stay that way. He says, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So why did we write so clearly and understandably, even though it hurt on occasion to have your sins called out? Well, it's because we love you. And whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And well, whom an apostle loves, the apostle will chasten as well. Paul loved the Corinthian saints. He'd spent so much time among them. He's writing them clearly. You read it, you acknowledge it. And even though it hurts a bit, please know we rejoice over you. And pray that you rejoice over us. Ye are our rejoicing. I hope that that applies to us. Even in a conference talk that we feel guilty during, when our consciences are pricked and we realize that I haven't been holy and godly, I don't have godly sincerity. In this area, I've got room for improvement. But thank you for calling me out. I rejoice in that because I know you rejoice in me. And the way Paul puts it here, it's all in the day of the Lord, Jesus. So think about when all is finally said and done and the Savior returns. What a relief that we've repented. Thank you so much for loving me enough to chasten me and to invite me to change. In verse 15 to 16, And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that you might have a second benefit a double blessing there. Another personal visit from Paul. I'd come, I'd seen some problems, I left, I wrote back to you, you've, you've responded, you've changed. I, I, I wanted to rush right back with all this confidence that we will someday rejoice over each other as we both change and come unto Christ. Talk about a second blessing, a second benefit that would have been. But I couldn't come at that moment. As he explains it, my plan was to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto you and of you to be brought on my way towards Judea. These were my missionary plans, my, my travel plans. I, I wanted Corinth to be another stopping place on my missionary journey. Oh, just to come and rejoice together. You're changing. You're growing up in God. You're, you're repenting of your sins. Thank you for accepting the affliction of a troubled conscience so that you could repent and have your conscience made clear through Christ. In verse 17, Paul says, When I therefore was thus minded, when I planned to come back and keep preaching to you and see how things were going, when that was my original plan, did I use lightness? Or in other translations, was I fickle? Did I change my mind? You might be wondering why I didn't come according to that plan. He says, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? I mean, there's worldly people out there. Those are those who purpose according to the flesh. Those are the type, they can't make up their mind. They say yes when they really mean no. I mean, these are those reeds shaken in the wind that Jesus was talking about. And just, oh, I'll just take the easiest path or the path of least resistance or, or say one thing and mean something else. No, that, that's not me. Please don't misjudge me for not coming straight back to you when it was my original intent. No, I, God, I'm serving at God's will. And I, I go where he sends me. The way he puts it in the next verse. But as God is true, 
Our word toward you was not yea and nay. We're not flip-flopping on you. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, admittedly, Paul's language is difficult there, but his feeling is beautiful. I, I'm sorry I couldn't come. I had plans and then they had to change, but I'm not just some kind of fickle switch things in the last second without thinking it through. No, I'm just going where the Lord sends me. But speaking of the Lord, do you not know what he's like? He's not promising yes and then coming out with no, especially when you are repenting of your sins or seeking comfort amidst your affliction. No, in him is yea. And <laughs> I love the way he puts it. I remember my wife is so good at this. When the kids, especially when they were little, when they would ask for things or want to do things, my wife made it a point to try to say yes whenever she could. Instead of just immediately jumping like, no, we don't have time for that. Or that's crazy that you want that. Or it's like, no, come on, grow up. It's like, no, 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 no. And sadly, as I, I know I'm guilty of this. I was too much of a no parent. And my wife, gently correcting me, <laughs> reminding me, you know, there's other ways we can help guide the kids' decisions without having to say no right off the bat. And if we can say, uh, not yet, or what about this? Or, well, here's some other options. Or just honor that. Because think about how it'll, lead, it'll leave the kids in a place of like, wait, you're, my parents are saying yay instead of nay? They're saying, amen, I agree, let's move forward. Wouldn't that give a child confidence in their own decision making? Wouldn't it help them grow in independence and a, self, a sense that I, I can do things and I can make plans and I can move forward and I can succeed in life? I love that ours is a God of yes, a God of amen agreeing with us as we're doing our very best to come up with plans for our future. I, I love this. To me, it's yet more evidence of God's confidence in us. You see more of that in verse 21 and 22, as Paul continues speaking of God. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. How's that for additional insight into this Father of mercies, this God of comfort? He's the one who establishes us. He digs deep. He lays the foundation. He builds us upon the rock so that no matter how harsh the winds that are blowing all around us, now we will not fall. Not only does he establish us, he anoints us. And usually it's kings and queens and priests and priestesses that are anointed. Beyond establishing and anointing, he has sealed us. In fact, he's sealed us his part of his eternal family. That's how invested he is in our ultimate consolation and salvation. And speaking of investment, that last line, he's given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Earnest. Have you ever heard of earnest money? Earnest money proves that you are in earnest to pay the rest of the debt back. It's like the down payment you put on a house. I'm serious about buying this thing. I want it. I am earnest in this. And therefore, I will earnestly work as much as I need to, do all that, that I can, that I have to, to be able to pay the loan back to the bank since I can't afford this house already. There's my down payment. There's my pledge. There's my promise. There's my earnest money. And what Paul is saying here, he's going to use the same phrase later in this letter and in other letters as well to describe the Holy Ghost, the earnest of the Spirit. And what's so beautiful about that is how do I know that God is fully invested in my consolation and salvation? How do I know he wants to bring me home? We saw this back in the book of Romans where it's like, well, he did send his son and let his son die on the cross. And if God is that invested in our salvation, then why would he hold anything back? He didn't even withhold his only begotten son. 
Well, in a similar vein, he didn't, if he didn't withhold the second member of the Godhead, he has, hasn't withheld the third member of the Godhead either. He is blessing you with the Holy Ghost and all the spiritual gifts that come with it. Remember, we talked about that back in 1 Corinthians. And all of that should stand as irrefutable evidence that God is serious about saving you. That he is fully invested in your exaltation. And the evidence he gives, among so many other pieces of evidence, is the earnest of the Spirit. Why don't I give you a, a feeling of the Holy Ghost that's just a, a preview of coming attractions. This is just a hint, a foretaste of the fruit of the tree of life. And when you feel the Spirit, it, what amazes me, I mentioned this a couple years ago in Doctrine and Covenants when we studied Session 76, that the telestial kingdom is, is where people can feel the Spirit. The terrestrial, they can enjoy the presence of, this, of, of the Savior. And the celestial kingdom is where they enjoy the presence of God. Now, of course, if you're in the top, then the Spirit and, and the Son and the Spirit are there for you as well. But what amazes me about that is it means that feeling the Holy Ghost is a telestial experience. <laughs> no wonder it far surpasses life on this world without such, without such a gift, without such companionship. That is the glory of the stars, which far surpasses the pitch black of a life without any God in the world. But then take it up a notch and go to the moonlight of Jesus, or take it up a great notch and see the sunlight of the Father of mercies himself, who establishes and anoints and seals. And then to prove it all, he gives you a little hint. He lets you have a telestial experience. I sometimes started firesides that way. Are you ready for a telestial experience together? And they're like, huh, it's going to be that bad? I'm like, oh no, it's going to be that good. We're going to feel the Holy Ghost together. And that is just a down payment on the realm of glory that will surpass all understanding. Are you with me? It, it, I love that thought. Every time you feel the Holy Ghost, God has made another. He, he's paying in installments. And not that he owes us anything, but it's a gift that he gives and keeps on giving. That's an endowment. That's what the word means, right? an endowment of, of spirit, an endowment of power, another down payment, another, another piece of evidence that he's fully invested in bringing us home. Okay, Think about that phrase every time you feel the Holy Ghost. This is earnest money. And God is in earnest when he says he'll save us. He then, Paul then ends the chapter 23 and 24. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul. So let me call God to the witness stand. I stake my life on this, my soul on this, that to spare you, I came not as yet unto Corinth. That's the reason I didn't come in person. I was going to spare you a personal rebuke. I was going to write you a letter instead so you'd have time to read it and think about it and make some changes. I had planned to come right back, but God had other plans for me, and it was to spare you. Not for that we have dominion over your faith. I'm not trying to say that, that you can't do anything without us, and we're, I'm here to lord over you and exercise unrighteous dominion. No, I don't have dominion over your faith. What am I instead? I am a helper of your joy, for by faith you stand. And that's all Paul's trying to do. Build their faith. Help them be happy. That's such a great phrase. What a, what a wonderful job description of an apostle of Jesus Christ. What are we? Oh, we are helpers of your joy. Wow. You want me to be more happy? Oh, yeah. Adam felt that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. What was Abraham seeking? Greater happiness and peace and rest that can only come through the blessings of the fathers. And so Paul and all of those who have succeeded him in the apostolic office, yes, they are helpers of joy by building our faith, because it is by faith that we stand. It makes me want to read everything Paul ever wrote. And again, grateful that he wrote it. If he'd come as planned and just spoken, then we, we wouldn't have it on record. So what a loss for us. But also, I wonder if the people would have been so emotionally up in arms, like, how dare you call us out? I've sometimes said to people that are struggling in a relationship, 
you might want to write the other person a letter. If it's a hard conversation, sometimes if it's written down, they can calmly read it and they don't have the chance to, to rebut right in the moment. No, they, they have to keep reading and, and you can be really careful with the way you phrase things. And, and I want to be crystal clear. And that's what Paul is doing in trying to craft these epistles. How do I say it in such a way that you might actually choose to change? Well, we're going to see more of this in chapter 2. As Paul is referring to these visits, these letters, these attempts on his part to cry repentance among the Corinthian saints. Chapter 2, verse 1, But I determined this with myself. Now, we remember when Paul determined something back in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians? There, among all these intellectual elite, and he said, I determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I had to decide in advance, I'm not going to go and try to prove everything intellectually. Nope, I'm going to rely on the power of God instead. Well, that was his determination in that letter. What's he referring to here? I determined with myself that I would not come again to you in heaviness. I, it was heavy the first time. It was heavy that those 18 months among you. We had great times. But we had some hard times. It was heavy when I wrote you. And I just made up my mind. Now, whether this is a physical visit or a literary visit, whether it's, I was going to come, that was my original plan, but then I was going to go through Macedonia and then go there and then come out and back. And nope, those plans changed because God changed them. Maybe he was the one keeping, I know it's going to be too heavy, so I'm steering you clear of that. Or did he go and decide, I, but I can't be heavy? Or did he write and I was concerned, I can't be as strong in my language as I want to be or as I'm tempted to be? No, that's going to come down as too heavy-handed. We don't know, again, we don't know all the details here, but there's something about Paul's determination that is inspiring to me. I may have come down too heavy the first time, so what am I going to do? I'm going to determine not to be so heavy the second time. I may have erred on the side of justice. I don't want to err again. So let me lean more in the direction of mercy. I'll be a little lighter since last time I was perhaps a little too heavy. To me, there's something powerful about that predetermination. And I think maybe that's why we count to 10 before we react, right? I got to calm down. I got to get in control of myself. I need to determine how I will respond in this situation. And there have been times where my wife has, okay, honey, this is what happened at home, or this is what the kids have gone through or done or whatever. Uh, I need you to think this through and, and plan on what our response will be. My wife is better at determining not to be heavy. And sometimes I'm too quick to react instead of calm enough to act. So determine, okay? There have been times I've... I actually, Elder, Elder Joseph B. Worthland said often when he was a young father and he was so busy with work and church responsibilities and everything else, he would drive home after a long day, he'd pull into his, drive, his, uh, his driveway, and before he'd get out of the car and enter the house, he would pray and say, Heavenly Father, I got nothing left, but I really need to recharge because I'm about to see the people that matter most in my life, but I've already used all my energy on others up to this point. Please help me be a good father and a good husband. Can you picture this future apostle determining with himself how he would act once he entered the door of his own home. Oh, I've got room for improvement there. But Paul felt the same, which is why he determined not to be heavy. He says, for if I make you sorry, and we're going to get a whole chapter later on about what kind of sorry Paul had in mind. That's chapter 7. But here in chapter 2, if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. That's a little confusing. He's basically just said, if I make you sorry, then I only have sorry people around. And then who's going to make me glad? <laughs> You're going to have to live with the people you correct. So you better do it kindly, okay? No wonder section 121 says, if you have to reprove betimes with sharpness, then do it, but only as 
motivated as prompted by the Holy Ghost. And then show forth afterwards a greater outpouring of love, lest they esteem thee to be thine enemy. That's such powerful advice. Because if, they, if I do it in the wrong way, and I come down too heavy-handed, then of course they're going to be sorry, but in, a, in an angry kind of way. In an enemy sort of way. And they'll think I'm their enemy, that's why I treated them that way, or came down on them hardly and heavily, harshly on them. And now who's going to make me glad? I certainly didn't cheer them up. They're not going to be able to cheer, cheer me up. Whereas if I chasten, because I love, but I do it in the right balance and with the right spirit that I determined beforehand to follow, then after the rebuke, I can show them that it was all motivated by love. A love that is stronger than any other emotion. A love that isn't rejoicing in their iniquity because it gives me a chance to call them out for it. No, it's a, a, it's a love, it's a charity that rejoiceth in truth, that beareth all things. And I've borne, I've borne it all. I'll continue to, but I'm also wanting you to grow up in God. So I make this correction. I show an outpouring of love. And now, having been comforted, you can comfort me. I've made you happy, even though I made you sorry for a little bit. And now you can make me happy because we're still all in this together. It actually ex helps explain how God approaches us in our sins as the Father of mercies, as the God of all comfort, calling us to repent in ways that, that show us his love, his confidence in us, his hope for us, and an outpouring of true charity. So we never have to look to God as if he were our enemy. And that's how Paul was trying to approach things. He said, I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. You see what Paul's doing? I wrote to correct you because I believe in you. I have confidence in all of you that you're going to be joyful. And I'm going to rejoice in that joy. My joy is yours and vice versa. And I knew you'd change if I just pointed out the places where you needed to make those alterations. Thank you for being open to that. Because it did worry me. Speaking of heaviness, verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you, with many tears, Picture a, a tear-stained epistle from Paul, worrying and weeping over the people to whom he's crying repentance. That was my affliction. That was my anguish. I just, I wasn't sure how you would take it. I was, I tried to be as careful as I could. What, did I come off too heavy? I'm sorry if that's the case. I didn't mean to hurt feelings. I meant to prick hearts, not crush them. I have confidence in you, but you needed to know where you were going wrong. So yes, I wrote out of affliction. I wrote out of anguish. I wrote with many tears. Not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. If we could correct others or discipline our children in a way that they know where we're coming from and that it hurts us to point out places where they need to change, that it's... it's <laughs> I'm the one shedding tears. I'm not trying to be mean and angry so that you start crying out of fear. No. I just want you to know how much I love you, how much I believe in you. Paul says, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. That is, I'm not overstating things. I'm not trying to put it too harshly. But I want you to know that I'm not the one getting hurt here. You guys are hurting each other. When he says, if any have caused grief, he hath grieved me, but only in part. I mean, I'm not living there in Corinth. I was there for a while, then I had to leave. I'll come back, but then I got to go. It's You're the ones that are members of the Corinthian First Ward. And so when I call you out for your division, divisions and the allowance of immorality among you, and you're not cleaning house, and you're not breaking down walls of separation... It, it doesn't affect me as much as it affects you. It doesn't grieve me as much as it 
grieves you, or at least as much as it ought to grieve you. You're the one that has to live in it, deal with it on a day-to-day basis. I was grieved in part. May you please be grieved in whole. Enough that you'll actually change. Now, verse 6 through 8, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Now, wait, what's he talking about here? Remember back in chapter, I think, 5 of 1 Corinthians is when he says, I told you already, you can't company with fornicators. You got you to sever those kinds of communions. He's not in the communion with Christ. He's committing major sins. Remember how strong worded the, that part of the letter was where it's like, I'm hearing about things, acts of fornication that not even, it would make a Gentile blush. And you covenant members of the body of Christ, this is a cancer that's going to need to be cut out. There has to be church discipline. You have to protect the innocent so that they know how serious sin can be. And so I'm going to pass judgment from a distance and it's guilty as charged and the man must be excommunicated for your sake as well as his. Maybe it'll jolt him into a realization that this is serious stuff he's, he's playing with. Remember, remember that whole conversation we had? Well, time has passed. It sounds like they... They passed the verdict that Paul had suggested and that they'd excommunicated the man. But in this balance between justice and mercy, in this contrary that must be proven, at what point does justice become too just to the part of harshness? At what point does justice need to be balanced with mercy because justice has already performed its saving role and mercy can now come in? Well, it's time. It's past time is what Paul is saying here. Powerful language. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment. It's gone on long enough. We, we can let him back in now. Okay, Let him come back into communion, into the community. Let him partake of the sacrament. Let him be rebaptized if need be. Whatever it is, let him off for good behavior. Okay, It's sufficient. The way Paul says it next. So that contrary-wise... We ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. This goes back to what that verse in section 121 we already talked about. Show afterwards the greater outpouring of love. The last thing we want this man to feel is that he's our enemy, because he isn't. Sin was his enemy, and he succumbed to it, but he repented. As a result, all the disciplinary councils that I've been a part of, it's usually half and half. Half were hard and half were absolutely beautiful. Because typically, a period of church discipline has a disciplinary council, or a membership council as they're now called, on both ends of it. And there is a council on the front end to hear the confession, to try to understand what the person has gone through and determine through the Spirit of God what's the best, what's the best way to help them change. Is it excommunication? Is it disfellowshipment? Is it formal probation or informal probation or no consequence at all? How big is the injury and therefore how big the band-aid? Or do we need a tourniquet? Or is it amputation? What, we're trying to save the soul of the sinner and save the soul of everyone that they've influenced. So how do we do this? But then there's a second disciplinary council after a period of repentance has taken place. And those are the beautiful ones. That's where you can just, the the atonement of Christ becomes almost tangible, where you can see in the countenance of this person the image of God. You can sense what changes they have experienced. And you're ready to partake of the sacrament again. You're ready to be baptized. You're ready to come back into full fellowship. Those, Those are beautiful. And Paul, again, is passing judgment from a distance, suggesting to the saints there in Corinth, has it been long enough? Can we help this prodigal come home? Has he hit rock bottom and eaten enough pig slop to come to himself? then let him come home with rejoicing. Run out to meet him. Bring the fatted calf and the robe and the ring. He that was lost is found. He that was dead is alive. 
So rejoice with him. The way Paul puts it here should be a reminder to every parent who wonders how long their child should be grounded, every priesthood leader that is wondering about the length of a repentance process. Whatever it might be, think about how quickly can I say that something is sufficient? And can I forgive him and comfort him? Because Paul's concern here, as the way, he, the way he describes it, I don't want him to be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. We're getting closer and closer to chapter 7, where we'll end this week, where we're going to talk about sorrow at length. And he's here, it's like, I don't, there's got to be just enough sorrow. We need to be in a Goldilocks zone of sorrow. Too little, and they don't think they have to repent. Too much, and they don't think they can. We talked about this in Alma chapter 39 and then 42, when Alma is chastening Corianton for major sins he'd committed. And was there an excommunication of sorts? There was discipline. But by the end of it all, by the end of the conversation, chapter 42, there's this Goldilocks zone of just how troubled he ought to be about his sins. Troubled enough to take them seriously, but not so troubled that he's paralyzed by his own sense of shame and sorrow. No, we gotta, we got to stay in the Goldilocks zone here. Just enough before it's over much. And so what does Paul beseech the people to do? Confirm your love. Prove to this good brother who's trying so hard to be good that you're not going to hold him hostage to his past, but that you forgive him and that you comfort him and that you love him so he knows you're not his enemy. Okay? Now verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things, so there's another reason why I wrote 1 Corinthians or whatever other letters might have gone missing over the ages. Okay? I wanted to have proof. I wanted to give you a chance to prove yourself and namely to prove your obedience. I called you to repentance to give you some advice on change. And have you done it? Will you do it? Now, he says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. You see, as an apostle, Paul is just acting in the Savior's name. He's Christ's representative. So he's calling out this sinner in Christ's name, but forgiving this now repentant sinner in Christ's name as well. So I forgive you in his person, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Uh, interesting there. Very seldom is Satan mentioned by name in Scripture, but Paul knows who he's up against. This is the ultimate adversary, and man, we know what he's up to. We've all succumbed to his temptations. We didn't take the escape route when we were shown it. But as a result, hopefully we've learned a few things. We know the tricks of his trade. And because we are not ignorant of those devilish devices, can we guard against the kinds of things Satan is trying to lead people into? Can we give someone an escape route? Right now, this brother is going to face a temptation that's about to get bigger than he can handle. And it's the temptation of giving up on the whole thing. That I'm, I'll never measure up. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I will have to suffer in my sins for the rest of my life. I, I'm an addict and there's no recovery Oh, be very careful before you allow the adversary to push him into that, that degree of self-loathing. Talk about a devilish device. So right now, before he starts to have over much sorrow, before, before he starts feeling like repentance is an impossibility, then show him the escape route, which is forgiveness in this case. You can come back to church, full fellowship, take communion with us. And we got, you, we got your back. You understand what he's saying here? That to me, especially the way he puts it in terms of, I will forgive you in the person of Christ. I'll represent him. Which in some ways then allows us to take Paul's words and put them in the Savior's mouth. After all, Paul is trying to put the Savior's words into his own. 
So let's reverse it. And let's assume Jesus is saying these words. And why is Christ asking us to forgive one another? Why is he asking us to approach one another with compassion and empathy and understanding and love? Well, to know the proof of us, to know what we're really made of. Will we obey him in all things, including his command to forgive others? To whom ye forgive anything. Again, this is Paul saying it, but imagine if Jesus is speaking. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. Because that opens up an amazing possibility as far as a principle to hold on to. How much of Christ's forgiveness of us depends on our forgiveness of each other? Now, part of that is like me. If I don't forgive others, then Christ doesn't forgive me. And he's made that clear elsewhere in Scripture. Okay? But there's another side of things like if you can just forgive that person, then I can forgive that person too. And until you do, I can't. Because again, I'm trying to create com communion both vertical and horizontal. There's actually a phrase from Joseph Smith that speaks to this issue in a really profound way. The prophet Joseph said this, I charge the saints not to follow the example of the adversary in accusing the brethren. Now think about how much this applies to this verse that Paul just gave us. Joseph is talking about the adversary. Paul is talking about Satan. And Satan just means the adversary. And we'll see this later on in the book of Revelation. But what, what, what does this adversary do? He accuses us. Revelation calls him the accuser of our brethren. And Joseph is using that, that title as he's describing the adversary here. Okay? I told the saints, you can't don't fall into the devilish device of the adversary himself who always goes around accusing one another and telling them, nope, they've done this and they're wrong in that. And he just constantly brings things up that, that repentance has laid to rest. But Satan cannot get past it. He refuses to ever forgive. And he tries to get us to be just as stubborn in holding people responsible for things that they're trying to get past. Now notice what Joseph says next. I said, if you do not accuse each other, God will not accuse you. In fact, if you have no accuser, you will enter heaven. Now pause there and wrestle with that. If no one accuses me, that's how I get into heaven? Well, I always thought it'd be God accusing me. I mean, he's the judge, right? And he's there and he's like, no, none shall pass. You've made all these mistakes, committed all these sins, and I refuse to forgive you. Well, what if God kind of hangs back and turns this into the people's court? And how does everyone here collectively feel about so-and-so? Oh, well, they, they shouldn't get in, and this because they did that, and I, there's all this anger and, and accusation. And I don't know if heaven would feel heavenly with all this discord. And they don't want you there because they're still accusing. You probably wouldn't want to be there because you're feeling accused and all eyes on me. And who wants to live in that kind of situation eternally? Whereas, if I can repent of my sins, if I can seek forgiveness from one another, if I can seek forgiveness from God, but also from my fellow brothers and sisters who have been told by God, forgive them just as I would, okay? We're all in the business of forgiveness, okay? I have, uh, am of a forgiving disposition, Joseph Smith said about God. Well, we better be of that same kind of disposition. My default setting is I forgive people. But if I do that, and again, as they know that they can be forgiven and they repent of their sins, I'm not here to accuse you anymore. Justice has served its purpose. Your sorrow led you to repent, and I don't want to push you over to the level of overmuch sorrow. And so, no, I have nothing to accuse you of. And if the people's court passes 
that kind of judgment, innocent, no accusations, then you, can you picture the Father of mercies smiling and saying, I'll vouch for that verdict. That's exactly right. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter now into the realm of rest. There's something... I would encourage you to keep chewing on this. And if I'm accusing others, on what basis? Why can I not let things go and be more forgiving? And if I'm the guilty party, how can I seek reconciliation? Remember that word. How can I seek reconciliation with those around me so that they no longer accuse me? Satan will want to accuse me till the cows come home. There's no getting around that one. But God knows not to take him seriously, and we should know the same. But one another, can we get to the point where there is no more accusation and no more need to accuse? In which case, come home. Please let the Spirit whisper to you the Lord's words, to whom ye forgive anything. I forgive. And thank you for being forgiving, as I am. In verse 12 and 13, Paul continues, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, so more missionary journeys, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Remember, he's trying to find out from Titus what are things like back in Corinth. And I went to a certain spot. I thought I'd find him there, but he wasn't there. And what am I going to do? Uh, I, I was worried about this. I, I, this is a just quick aside here about Paul's mission. But I love the fact that he was focused on a, a companion and wondering how he was doing and where he was. And I, I wanted to come. I wanted to preach. The door was wide open, but I couldn't take it because someone else was in need. This is actually Ammon putting a whole Lamanite village on hold to go help Aaron out of prison. Oh, I, the door's open for me, but the door's been shut on Aaron. I got to let him out first. And then I'm sure other doors will open for us both. But I got to save my companion before I can go back and save converts. There seems to be a hint of that here, okay? Missionary success is secondary when you've got a companion that you're responsible for. And Paul is worried about Titus here. Then verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And the Greek is actually odd here because the, it suggests a triumphal procession, like a victory parade. But in, in Roman times, when the general would come home from conquest, what kind of parade would he bring? He'd be parading the people he'd conquered and taken captive. As you can picture a big, picture a big smile on the face of the general and his conquering troops. But how would the slaves look? as they're being dragged into the city in chains. That's devastation, but not for Paul. It's this really interesting reversal of the, of the metaphor that Christ has come home triumphant. Okay, He's the one marching into town. And what does that make the rest of us? Well, his captives. <laughs> what, what an honor to be captive to Christ. What an honor to be a servant of God. So thanks be to God, which causeth us to triumph in Christ. I want to belong to him. He says, he maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And savor, that's smell, that's taste. These are delicious doctrines that we get to teach. And so here I am riding triumphant alongside him. I'm his and other converts that I bring. We are all captive to Christ in the most glorious liberty that the gospel provides. We collectively belong to him. And what a beautiful, sweet-smelling doctrine that knowledge provides. This is the fruit of the tree of life. And man, you got to taste it. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Well, in them that are saved. In them that perish, well... Let's think this through. To the one we are the savor of death unto death. To the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? 
Interesting question to ponder. What do we smell like spiritually? I mean, to those who perish, he said, we smell like death. Like, whew, you smell like death warmed over. What have you been doing? But is that because we smell bad or that they smell poorly? You understand the difference? Do I have the stench of sin on me or have I been cleansed through the atonement of Christ? Have those sins been washed free? So the stink is actually in their nostrils, not in mine. This might go back to what he was saying earlier about forgive him. It's past. It's okay. I cleaned him up. He doesn't stink. And so if you think he does, if you keep accusing him of stinking and push him over the edge into self-loathing and over much sorrow, oh, the stink was in your nostrils. You're the type who perish because you want everyone to perish all around you. No, to those who perish, this is the savor of death unto death. But to those who are saved and who want to save others, those who have been forgiven and want others to, to taste the sweetness of forgiveness themselves, oh, that's the savor of life unto life. That's perfume. That's good cologne. It's good, amazing deodorant. There's neither stench on the person nor stench in my nostrils because I would not accuse them of anything. You understand? I do love these, the sensory experience Paul is trying to evoke in us. I used to joke, whenever we go camping or you're on trek or whatever and you come home smelling like campfire, campfire is a strong smell. But generally it's a positive one. It's a good one. And what amazes me in the pioneer days or days before deodorant, it's like, good thing they had to cook everything over a fire. This is like two wrongs making a right. Because there's some nasty body odor. These people stink. But then you got to go cook over a fire, and it's like the one thing that's strong enough to overpower the stench. And it actually smells pretty good. So yeah, I'll, I'll smell like smoke instead of smelling like sweat. I'd rather smell like the, the smoke of the sacrifice. Think about the altars in the tabernacle and the temple. There's an altar of sacrifice where people are making their burnt offerings. And that's going to smell like a barbecue, which in my mind, one of the greatest smells ever. Keep wondering, when are they going to make barbecue scent candles? I mean, yeah, we can smell lemons and oranges and pine and everything else. But how about some good old beef brisket, huh? <laughs> there's, there's a scent. And then get closer and closer to God. And what do you pass right before you cross the veil? The altar of incense with all of this glorious perfume, this aroma that fills the tabernacle, fills the house of God, that you smell as you enter God's presence. Smells bring memories in ways that not even sight does. You ever just pass by some smell and it's like, oh, I remember, remember exactly where I was the first time I smelled it. Or it just brings all the, think these memories come rushing back. There's something about the sweet savor the smell, the taste, the fruit of the tree of life, the incense rising to heaven. That's, it's a sensory experience. Think about the sacrament as a sensory experience. And wow, how do I smell to others? And how am I smelling those around me? Is it life to life or is it death to death? It says something about both of us. I need to be more forgiving. Okay, clean out my own nostrils. I remember that <laughs> as a kid. This is weird. You're going to think I'm strange, but you already do. And I remember that as a, you, you children of the 80s probably remember this too. There was this, this breath spray called Banaka. And it was in this little spray. It was a little tube. looked almost like a really thin lipstick, lipstick tube. But you take out the lid and you'd spray it in your mouth a couple of times. just And it was supposed to give you fresh breath. And if you're going on a date, you better have some Banaka on you. Remember those days? Well, I remember once as a weird teenager wondering what it would be like, not in my mouth, but in my nose. And I, squirt, I squirted the banaka in my nostrils and woo, that stung. But everything smelled minty after that. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, this is, I didn't keep repeating it because it stung so much. But I realized maybe that's the real solution to bad breath is if I can't, because I can't control the other person. If I can't squirt banaka into their mouth, I can just squirt it into my nose. 
and I've solved the problem. Well, is what's the savor in my own nostrils? And am I sufficiently forgiving to the point that everybody smells good to me? <laughs> you understand? Now, verse 17, final verse of this chapter. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So I don't know who else has been coming around town. I don't know what false missionaries or false prophets you've had to confront. I don't know what worldly philosophies have trickled down from Athens. But that's not us. We're not corrupting God's word. We're not peddlers for profit. We're not religious hucksters and spiritual salesmen. We're giving you the truth. We are sincere. We are speaking for God because we take his truth seriously. And we hope you do too. In fact, if you turn the page and look at chapter 3, let's take the truth seriously. Let's see where it's coming from and what, how the Lord is raising the bar on his expectations for all of us. I, I love, there's some principles in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians that I, I often come back to, especially when I study the Old Testament. I mentioned one of these verses last year in our study of the Old Testament. We'll see it in just a moment. But particularly for those Jewish Christians in the, in the room, they're going to perk up with this chapter. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? I mean, the way he ended chapter 17, I, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. Uh, I'm not corrupt like others. I'm sincere, but I'm also sincerely humble. I'm just grateful for the chance to preach God's grace and spread his peace. So I'm not trying to commend myself. Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? We're back to proving ourselves. Do I need a letter of recommendation? Do you need me to submit a resume online? Or, so I'm not commending myself nor recommending myself. You should know who I am as an apostle of the Lord. He says, ye are our epistle. And he said that in 1 Corinthians 2. The proof of my apostolic call, the proof that I was sent by the Lord, is that you've come unto the Lord through my words. Okay? So, ye are our epistle. And it's written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Everybody sees you as the evidence that we are sent by God. It's like when students turn out really good, and that's the best credential a teacher could ever have. Okay? It's like, wow, th that was, I helped mentor that person. Look how amazing they are, how amazing they turned out. And with that in mind, Paul says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Now, obviously, Paul is drawing a parallel to Mount Sinai. That these tables of stone, there's the Ten Commandments that God wrote on it with his own finger. But what he's really trying to write on are the fleshy tables of the heart. He's trying to change you. And the question is, will, are you willing to be changed? Is your heart as hard as the stone of Sinai? Well, God can even write on that. But he might end up having to break that heart and grind it down to powder Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and then pour in some living water to reconstitute the clay. Because it's soft clay that God wants to work on. You ever tried to make something out of Play-Doh that's been left in, in the tub that's been left open? And it's rock hard? Yeah, good luck with that. Our hearts need to be fleshy, as in soft. Because if they are sufficiently soft, then yes, God can write within them. And that's what he's trying to write upon. It's not ink he's using, it's spirit. Have you ever tried to write on something where it just won't hold the ink? It's like you're writing on, I don't know, hard plastic or something, and it just it can't grip the pen, the ballpoint pen, and no ink is coming through. Is, am I inscribable to God? Is he able to write upon me? Is my heart sufficiently soft? Verse 4 through 6, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Or in other words, toward God we have trust because it comes through Christ. I mean, what's going to soften my heart? Christ will. What's going to make it possible for God to change me? Christ will. That's our trust. 
Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, which is such a humble statement on Paul's part. Yes, I lack self-sufficiency. I am horribly inadequate compared to the calling I've been given. But God can handle it. Whom the Lord calls, the Lord qualifies, and he's qualifying me. My sufficiency is of God. Or as we see elsewhere in Scripture, his grace is sufficient for us. So Paul says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You see, Paul is trying to inscribe in us. He's trying to allow God to write upon our fleshy tables. He is an able minister. Not able of himself, but able through Christ. Sufficiency is in him. But an able minister of the New Testament. It's that Old Testament that says you've blown it and there's no coming back. It's that Old Testament that you thought you had to swing across the chasm between you and God on a chain that had to hold. But any small sin and the chain of law breaks. Remember our discussion in the book of Romans? The law drops you into the pit. The law cannot save you because you couldn't live the law perfectly. And so that Old Testament leaves you hopeless. But I pray that through the grace of God, I can be an able minister of a new testament. That that stone-hard commandment, that unbending law, that you could not live to perfection. No, God's trying to write something in you. And that, it's not ink, it's spirit. And spirit giveth life. Letter kills. I mean, if the letter is saying it has to be perfect then anytime you fall short of the letter of the law, you missed a jot, you missed a tittle, any small error, and it's over. That letter killeth. But the spirit that understands where you're coming from, understands where you're falling short, but is trying to redeem you, is willing to condescend to be with you, understands the pain that you're feeling, the the sorrowing over your own sins, doesn't want you to overmuch sorrow. And so let's stay in the Goldilocks zone. We can get through this together. Hold on to me. My chain holds. Let's come back to God together. That's the kind of life that is promised in the New Testament. Because it's a New Testament in the blood of Jesus. Paul is an able minister indeed. He's taking people who know the old and introducing them to the new. People who only had hope in the law and therefore were hopeless because of the law. And introducing them to hope in Christ. The the spirit. It has a flexibility that the letter lacks. And not that the spirit is just going to let you slide. No. But the spirit infuses justice with mercy. And allows us to learn from our mistakes instead of being condemned by them. So, while we're on the subject of Old and New Testament, verse 7 and 8, But if the ministration of death, and that's what the letter of the law is, it killeth, so it's the ministration of death. Remember, part of that death was necessary to shut your mouth, as he said to the Romans, right? Uh, What he was trying to kill was your false sense of self-sufficiency. But that ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, stone tablets, That was glorious. Now, it's interesting he would say that. But then again, Paul was a Jew and a Pharisee who loved the law and knew it inside and out. He keeps quoting from it every chance he gets. It was a glorious ministration, even though it killed people, okay? Even though it left people far short of the level that God intended. But it was a glorious thing. It's moving them in the right direction. It's trying to get Egypt out of the Israelites, (laughs) having gotten Israel out of Egypt. That was a glorious thing. I love the Old Testament, Paul is saying, even though it was a a lower law, a lower level, a ministration of death. But think about it. If that was glorious, so glorious, in fact, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, then think about it. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? 
in fact, infinitely more glorious than what you'd seen before. Now, Paul seems to be jumping around a little bit here, but try to follow his focus. He's comparing Old Testament to New. He's comparing law to grace. He's comparing strict, unbending justice to a more flexible mercy that, that refuses to rob justice, but fulfills it in a, in a more patient way. He's comparing Jesus to Moses. He's comparing spirit to letter. There's this beautiful comparison he's running through. But right here in the middle, he says, now, wait a minute. Think about Moses coming down from Sinai. Remember what he looked like? Well, of course not. You couldn't see him. His face was so glorious. The, the Michelangelo statue where it shows Moses with the horns was a bad translation because it was rays of light that were shiny, beaming off his countenance. And a bad translation left that horns and... I guess Michelangelo was a biblical literalist. But what was this? This was glory shining in Moses' countenance because he'd just been in the presence of God. Moses had to put a veil over his face to keep people from freaking out. It's like the sunglasses haven't been invented yet for your sake, so I'll put a veil on me to, to solve the issue. And what Paul is saying here is that was a temporary fix, the law was. It was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, he'll say in a later letter. It was preparation. It was prerequisite. But eventually it's going to be eclipsed by a far more brilliant light. Moses was terrestrial. I mean, the law was terrestrial. The gospel celestial. Moses was to get you to a point. But Jesus was meant to get you the whole distance. So think about how glorious... What I love what Paul is doing, he's paying homage to the Old Testament and the law of Moses that he was raised with. It's a glorious thing. But compare Moses coming down from Sinai to Jesus on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> and Moses can't hold a candle. No candle needed. <laughs> Jesus is the light of the world. And so if you thought the old law was glorious... You ain't seen nothing yet. The new gospel, a gospel of mercy, if you repent, a gospel of forgiveness so that other people can repent, a gospel whereby we stop accusing one another and God stops accusing us. Accusation, when it's ongoing and relentless, is a devilish device. Paul already said it. But that's the law for you. The law can't get over it. The law has no wiggle room. It can't it, there's no flexibility. That's why it kills. Even though it gloriously was attempting to help you lift yourself to a higher level. But the spirit, the fleshy tables, the forgiveness that comes through the mercy and grace of the Father of mercies himself, that is glorious. That's the New Testament. And I pray I am an able minister of it. Is this making sense to you? Paul hopes so. So do I. He then says in verse 9 through 11, similar image. For if the ministration of condemnation, there's the law of Moses, if it be glory, and again, think how glorious Moses' face was. If it's that good, if it gets you from a telestial up to a terrestrial level, we've traded out stars for moonlight in all its beauty, if that's glorious, then much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. You got it? You thought moonlight was good? Wait for the sun to start shining. You thought terrestrial kingdom was a kingdom of glory. Oh, it is. <laughs> but it can't hold a candle to celestial glory. So think of the New Testament being greater than the Old Testament. Think about Christ being greater than Moses. Think about grace being superior to law. Think about spirit eclipsing letter no matter how good 
all of those first drafts were. You ain't seen nothing yet. So what are we going to see? Verse 12 and 13. Seeing then that we have such hope. And it's hope that comes through Christ. It's hope that I can be transfigured and not just veiled. Seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. I mean, sorry, it might hurt at first, but it's, it's out of love. It's wet with tears. I'm calling it like it is because I'm trying to lead you into the Spirit. I'm not, con- I'm not beating you over the head with the law. I'm not smashing the, tables, the tablets of stone over you. But I am trying to break your heart enough that it's soft enough for God to write on. I'm trying to make it fleshy so that the Spirit can give you life, so that you'll repent knowing that God will forgive you. That's the hope that we preach, and it's the great plainness that we use when we preach it. Not as Moses, he said, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. That's why Paul is being crystal clear. I'm not veiling my language when I call you to repent. I'm not pulling any punches. I'm not sugarcoating sin. It's serious, believe me. Jesus didn't sugarcoat it for me. He called me out. He brought me to my knees. He blinded me. Yeah, no veil there. But in blinding me, he opened my eyes. In breaking my heart, he softened it. In bringing me to my knees, he lifted me up into his presence. And so I cannot veil my language. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's what Jesus told me. It's what I'm trying to tell you. So please, quit quit kicking. The prick isn't going anywhere. God is still trying to nudge us, prod us forward along the covenant path. Will we be hard-hearted? Or will we be soft? But I will not veil my language. And speaking of veils, one more mention, verse 14 through 16. But their minds were blinded, those Old Testament Israelites, and not just them, even their descendants, Their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And that's what Paul is hoping for. It's what he's working toward. At the crucifixion, that veil was already rent in twain from top to bottom. There's no separation. We can come into the presence of God. That's the atonement, the at one But sadly, there are still so many people holding to the old law and beating themselves up with it. Or you holding other people to the old law, which was so inflexible and unforgiving. No, can we read the Old Testament through the lens of the new? Paul was so good at that. Think about how many times he weaves together Isaiah and Hosea and Psalms and all these other Old Testament passages to teach New Testament principles. He saw Jesus in all those messianic prophecies and he's trying to prove the point anytime someone will listen. The problem is people are still reading it with that veil. I mean, we've seen veil, the veil protected people from the glory of Moses. But does the veil sometimes obscure our vision when it's things that we need to see in crystal clarity? You see, too often, Israelite past, Judaism present, they're reading the Old Testament and missing its point. They think it speaks of a Messiah that has not yet come. But Paul knows that Jesus has come. (laughs) The Messiah, the Messianic prophecies have been fulfilled. So how do you see the the Old Testament in the way that you should? What pierces the veil that's upon it? Well, Jesus does. He tore the the temple veil in half, but he also tore apart the veil that obscures our view of the Old Testament. That's why I shared this verse in our Old Testament study last year. I wanted people to know that the Old Testament is the ultimate game of Where's Waldo? 
but it's someone far superior to Waldo that we're searching for. It's Jesus on every page. And if we'll develop the eyes to see, if we'll see through the lens of Jesus Christ, just look for him, assume that he's there, and he'll start to be visible chapter after chapter, page after page. Okay? So the veil is done away in Christ. The veil helped. It was on our hearts, but it's gone because now our heart, what used to be hard, is now soft. It's fleshy. God is writing on it. He's changing me with flexible spirit instead of concrete stone. And that spirit is giving life. It's breathing life into the law and giving me hope that I can learn from the times that I've broken it instead of it breaking me over itself. Finally then, verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that spirit. He's the lens. He parts the veil. He's, he writes on fleshy tables. He is the source and goal of everything. The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom from the bondage of the law. You can come out from Egypt. You can head to the promised land. The Passover lamb has been slain. The Spirit is present. It's inviting you to come forward. You are free to move forward. There is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. That sounds a lot like what he said back in 1 Corinthians 13, right? We're looking in a glass darkly. We're staring in the mirror, but we're not sure what we see. Well, here we see it. With open face, we're beholding in a glass. The, we, the, we pulled out the Windex, and the, the mirror is, is crystal clear. And what do we see? We see the glory of the Lord. And through it, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Oh, how's that for <laughs> cleaning up? How's that for looking in the mirror and actually liking what you see? Not the dingy reflection of the natural man or woman, but the image of the glory of God written in your countenance. Of course it's going to come out of your countenance. It's already been written in the fleshy tables of the heart. And it just starts to change you. You progress from glory to glory. Sounds a lot like grace to grace that we've seen before. And if we'll simply accept the glory and accept the grace and act on it, live into it, be changed by it, then God will give us more grace and more glory as we ascend the staircase home. I've heard it said that the longer a couple is married, the more they start to look like each other, which is the best news I've ever heard and the worst news my wife's ever heard. <laughs> I only have room for improvement, but I'm gonna, I feel like I'm dragging her down. But that kind of similarity, because of the covenant relationship we're in, well, imagine being sealed to the Savior and having His image engraven upon your countenance. Imagine progressing from glory to glory until you are changed into His image. Oh, there's a veil needed. And yet, a veil parted as the Lord allows us to see Him and see ourselves for who we really are. That's what Paul has been hoping for, working toward, writing about this whole time. And with faith in his readers, with faith in the people, the saints of Corinth, he believes he will then see them for who they will really be. That he will, wipe across, he will wipe the smudges off the mirror. And to be able to see these fellow saints having repented of their sins, having trusted in the New Testament, having seen Jesus on every page, they'll see themselves and know that they are like him. <laughs>